Our world is changing. Are you prepared for what comes next? One man's life revealed Earth's future. His final week. A prophecy of Earth's final events. There is only one safe path through the coming storm. Him. Living in the final week. Unveiling your prophetic future. Well, good evening. It's good to be back with you. Thank you for coming once again. This is part two of our series, Living in the Final Week. The title of tonight's study is The Woman in the Wilderness. Now, last night, if you're here, you know that we looked at the Old Testament and the many parallels that exist between Christ's life and the formation of Old Testament Israel. And we noted this principle that whatever happens to the head must also happen to the body. And we saw that Jesus is the head of the church, uh, his church is the body, and so whatever happens to Jesus in his life must also be an experience that the church passes through. And this is one of the many reasons that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, And the life. If we want to uh, know what truth is, if we want to live in it and accept it and share it with others, then it must be the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. And uh, this is why we're spending these thoughtful hours, these four nights, studying the life of Jesus Christ, especially those closing scenes. Before we go any further tonight, we're going to stop and we're going to ask for the Lord's guidance and blessing. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity and the freedom to gather together and to worship. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and discernment and an understanding of these things that we find in your word. Most importantly, Father, we ask that you would not only give us information, but transformation into the character of Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start tonight uh, with a personal story, and it's a story of my father-in-law. You can see him there in uh, the picture with my children. He uh, passed away from COVID in December of 2020. This picture was taken several months before that. As with many people that... uh, came down with this disease and succumbed to it. He spent his final days alone in a hospital room um, by himself, eventually on a respirator, and then passing away. But I want to share with you a couple of text messages that my father-in-law sent to me while he was in the hospital um, as he approached those final days of his life. This is the first one he sent. He said, I am so glad to be here right where God wants me. He is doing just what I told God I wanted him to do. And more on that later. I love my family. Now, he never got a chance to tell me what he meant by more on that later. He did uh, talk to my wife, his daughter, uh, a day or two after sending me this text message, and he gave her a little bit more of the story. He said, Stacy, I have been praying for months now that God would do whatever is necessary in my life so that I will be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ, so that I can stand in front of Jesus when he returns. And it's clear to me that my father-in-law, while of course he was hoping, as we all were, that he would recover and find his way out of that hospital room, it is clear to me that he believed he was right where God wanted him to accomplish that purpose, that work of cleansing, of purification, of preparation 
for the return of Jesus. Here's another text that my father-in-law sent to some friends of ours about the time that he had written me. He says, God has me right where he wants me in his end time most holy place, laundry, getting me cleaned up to see him coming soon. I have no uncertainty, no anxiety, no fear thanks to resting in his hands. There is no place safer or more comfortable to be, and I am a blessed man. Praise the Lord. What a way to leave this world, friends. And I have been sharing this every opportunity I get with as many people as I can because I find this attitude, this mindset of staring death in its face and yet holding on in faith to God and saying, thank you, Lord, whatever you may choose to bring me through or to allow me to pass through, I will trust in you. I will not let go. We read in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 493, God will do great things for those who trust in him. The reason why his professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much to their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal his power in their behalf. He will help his believing children in every emergency if they will place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. It's a good promise, isn't it? Tonight, we're going to look at some more parallels between the life of Christ and the experiences that his church passes through. Specifically, we're going to look at the raising of Lazarus, who literally walked through the valley of the shadow of death, but came through on the other side because of his faith and obedience to God. You know, Jesus would have never worked that miracle for Lazarus if Lazarus had not been living up to the light that he had and following Jesus wherever he went. And we're going to look at the parallels and similarities between the raising of Lazarus and the events surrounding the Protestant Reformation. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are Protestants and we are uh, heirs and descendants of this Protestant Reformation. We need to understand the issues because, as you know, Just a few years ago, the world declared, at least much of it, declared that the Protestant Reformation is over. And we're done with that, and we don't need to worry with that anymore. We are done protesting. So we need to look tonight, what were they protesting against? Why were they protesting? On what basis were they protesting? And how did God work through all of this to bring his church, his his people, his body back to life like he did Lazarus? Now, here's the principle that we've been working off of, Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 25. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Amen. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be what? One flesh. And so just as a man and woman are joined in marriage, and they now hopefully live life and share their experiences together, Jesus wants the same thing with his church. He wants the same thing with his people. Whatever happens to the head must also happen to the body. That's right. And so just reviewing from last night, last night we looked at the life of Christ, specifically his early experiences and the history of Old Testament Israel. And we saw some amazing parallels. Jesus was the son of promise, just as Isaac was a son of promise. Jesus' name and Isaac's names, uh, name was both declared before their births. Jesus was born miraculously, as was Isaac. Joseph took his family to Egypt. And uh, in, the, in the story of Jesus, Joseph, of course, being Jesus' father, took his family to Egypt to escape Herod. And in uh, the history of Israel, Joseph, the son of Jacob, took his family to Egypt also to escape um, hardship from the famine. The male babies were killed by Herod in Jesus' story. Male babies were also killed by Pharaoh in Israel's history. Uh, Finally, we see Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and Israel was, the Bible says, baptized in the Red Sea. Jesus declared the law of God in the Sermon on the Mount, and from another mountain centuries before, Israel was given the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. Finally, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness And Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. Last night, we looked at Revelation chapter 12 also. 
and we notice that there is one woman in this chapter. At first, she begins pregnant. This is describing God's church in Old Testament times before the Messiah is born. So she is pregnant, awaiting for the arrival of the Messiah. Then after the time of Jesus, after he returns to heaven, that same woman flees into the wilderness. So it's the same uh, basis on which God is working, that is faith in God, obedience to his commandments, uh, accepting Jesus, the Son of God, as your Savior. Uh, God is not working on a different plan of salvation now in the New Testament times as he did in Old Testament times. And so this woman, in the middle of Revelation chapter 12, flees into the wilderness. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight, this experience that the church had in those centuries of fleeing in the wilderness. Now, we touched on this last night, but let's look a little more closely here. In the life of Christ, we notice some parallels now with this woman in the wilderness. So Jesus was baptized. That's recorded several places in the um, Gospels. Mark 1 verse 10 is one of those places. It says that Jesus received the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Then, in Mark 1 verse 12, Jesus is led into the wilderness. In verse 13, it says that he was surrounded by wild beasts and ministered to by angels. And then we know, there's no single verse that tells us this, but we can tell very clearly when we combine the gospel accounts together and we make a harmony of the gospels that Jesus' public ministry lasted three and a half literal years. And we know that because there's mention of different Passovers, three Passovers that uh, are mentioned in the gospels there. Now that's the experiences of the head. What do we find prophetically when we look at what will happen to the woman or the body? Well, uh, we know that the church received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. That's recorded in Acts chapter 2. And then going back to Revelation chapter 12, the woman is led into the wilderness just like Jesus. Whatever happens to the head must happen to the body as well. Then in Revelation chapter 12, the woman is surrounded by the dragon and the beast but is also nourished by God, just like Jesus, the head. He was surrounded by wild beasts and he was ministered to by angels. Whatever happens to the head must also happen to the body. And finally, we have a time element that is also similar. Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 14 tell us that the woman is in the wilderness for three and a half prophetic years. And Jesus' ministry lasts for three and a half literal years. So some fascinating parallels. Whatever happens to the head must also happen to the body. Mark chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 say, Immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Revelation chapter 13, because we're going to look at the prophetic description of these wild beasts that surround the woman when she is in the wilderness. And let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 1. We'll read the first two verses. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, uh, this beast comes up out of the sea and it, uh, along with the dragon, ends up trying to attack the woman and uh, attacking the saints later on in the chapter and really attacking God as well. And uh, the real object is to attack God, but, uh, you know, Satan and uh, any earthly powers, they can't attack God directly because God is in heaven and Satan has been kicked out. And he's not strong enough anyways, so the only thing left to do is to attack the body of Christ here on earth. Now verse 2 goes on and says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So here is uh, this description of this beast that rises up out of the sea. It's kind of a conglomeration of, of several different animals, a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and then some other body parts from who knows what, maybe dinosaurs or just strange animals all thrown together. And this beast ends up being the great um, 
antagonist, an enemy of God and of the saints, uh, and trying to attack this woman, just like happened to the head being attacked by wild beasts. Now in verse 3, we find out a little bit more. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all of the world wondered after the beast. Now there's some fascinating parallels here between this beast and Jesus. This beast comes up out of the water just like Jesus did at his baptism. This uh, beast, uh, in other prophecies, this beast uh, has an, a period of activity for 42 months or for three and a half prophetic years. Just like Jesus, his public ministry lasted for three and a half literal years. In verse 3, we see that one of his heads is wounded as to death, so it receives a deadly wound. And then his deadly wound is healed. And then all the world wonders after the beast. Jesus received a deadly wound. In fact, he was killed. He was crucified. And yet he rose again. So that deadly wound was healed. And Jesus said that if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And so we see here that the beast in Revelation 13 that comes up out of the sea is really, um, it's a counterfeit of Jesus Christ, we could call it the Antichrist power. Anti means both against, but also in place of. And we see that this power not only fights against God and his people, but it tries to take the place of Jesus. And so this is the Antichrist power of Bible prophecy. Now this is not my personal interpretation. This is not a Seventh-day Adventist unique interpretation. This is an understanding of Bible prophecy that Protestants have held for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, except for the last few years. Somehow we have lost this recently. But here is one example. This is from Henry Grattan Guinness, a very uh, prominent Protestant writing uh, in the late 1800s. And he said to the reformers, Rome was the Babylon of the apocalypse and the papal pontiff, the predicted man of sin. Separation from the church of Rome and from its pontifical head was regarded by them as a sacred duty. To them, separation from Rome was not separation from Christ, but from Antichrist. This was the principle upon which they began and prosecuted the work of the Reformation, the principle which directed and supported them and rendered them invincible. Okay, so that's the historical view that uh, all the Protestant reformers held. And just for a moment or two, let's look at where we are in the world today because the uh, Bible predicts that if this power, the papal power, is indeed this beast of uh, Bible prophecy, that it will recover from its deadly wound and that all the world will eventually follow after it. So what do we see in the world today? Well, here's a statement from Tom Doyle who was a Catholic priest, is a Catholic priest, and former canon lawyer for the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C. And he said in an interview, the Holy See is the last absolute monarchy in the world today. The Pope, when he is elected, is answerable to no human power. He has absolute authority over the entire Roman Catholic Church, direct authority that reaches down to individual members. Interesting statement, again in Revelation 13, Verse 2, it indicates that this beast power would receive a lot of power and authority. Unfortunately, it comes from the dragon. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So what we read here, uh, a modern description or explanation of the papal power, it fits with Bible prophecy exactly. What else did uh, Mr. Doyle say? He said, in the Roman Catholic Church, the office of pope includes the three main offices of government. He is the supreme judge, the supreme legislator, and the supreme executive. So there's no separation of powers. There is no possibility of checks and balances. Now, this, according to Bible prophecy, is the power that at the end of time will uh, eventually capture the entire world's allegiance, except for a small group of people that Revelation calls the saints. And um, Revelation talks about these group of people and explains their characteristics. How do they avoid following after this beast? Revelation 14, verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Two unique characteristics, friends. 
that separate the followers of God from everybody else here on earth. They keep the commandments of God. They recognize the authority of the Bible. They see in this not just a normal book or a collection of books, but they see it as the divine message of God to humanity. And they recognize its authority in their lives. That's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is that they have the faith of Jesus. Uh, Now, this can mean a couple of things. Uh, Some versions say faith in Jesus. We absolutely need faith in Jesus. So these people accept Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord. Other versions render it the faith of Jesus. And that kind of suggests that their quality or level of faith is similar to that which Jesus uh, demonstrated in his life. We'll look at that in a couple of nights more closely. But the two great characteristics, they keep the commandments of God and they accept Jesus as their Savior. Now, when Pope Francis spoke to the United States Congress several years ago, he said, we must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism, whether religious or of any other kind. Now, he gave this statement while the war against um, radical fundamentalists in uh, other religions was still uh, going on pretty heavily. And so most folks, when uh, today, when we use the word or hear the word fundamentalist or fundamentalism, we'll immediately think of, you know, these horrible incidences where people are blowing themselves up and committing suicide and ramming planes into buildings and things like this. But we want to look at what this power identifies or defines as fundamentalism. Because here Pope Francis is warning the United States Congress to beware of fundamentalism or fundamentalists. What did he mean by that? Well, the website Catholic Answers says, the belief that is first and foremost the defining characteristic of fundamentalists is their reliance on the Bible to the complete exclusion of any authority exercised by the church, and the second is their insistence on a faith in Christ as one's personal Lord and Savior. Now, friends, we just saw in Revelation 14, verse 12, that if we want to, uh, if we want to be on God's side in this battle against good and evil, that we need to keep the commandments of God. We need to recognize the authority of the Bible. And we need to keep those commandments of God no matter what people may tell us. And secondly, we must have faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus. Friends, fundamentalists, according to this definition, by uh, the Roman Catholic Church wipes out both of those pillars that we must stand on. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says this in regards to Jesus and his work for us. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God cleanse your what? Your foot? Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Is that what Jesus wants to cleanse for us today? No. It says cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This is the point. If we were to summarize the entire message of the book of Hebrews into one sentence, it is simply this. Jesus is our high priest in heaven, and he wants to write the law of God on your mind and your heart. And when he does this, when he accomplishes this new covenant promise in your life, writing the law of God on your mind and your heart, He now has control of your conscience and your character. So with that in mind, here is one final statement from the Roman Catholic Church. As a full member of the international community, the Holy See finds itself in a very peculiar situation because it is spiritual in nature. Its authority is religious and not political. And now I'm going to show you the end of the quote. What would would you guess if uh, you had to guess? How will they end this statement? What is the realm of their authority in its truest sense? If it's not, uh, you know, political or so forth. Here's what they say. The real and only realm of the Holy See is the realm of conscience. So we see that there is a power in this world today, friends, that is vying with Jesus Christ and that wants not only the power and the position and the authority of Jesus, but also wants to control the consciences of human beings, just like Jesus wants to. There's just one difference. 
Jesus will never force us or compel us to give our will and our conscience over to him, but the devil will. And his agents here on earth will as well. And Bible prophecy tells us very clearly that at the very end of time, when the mark of the beast is enforced, this really is the issue. A battle over the conscience and over the mind, and whose authority will you recognize in your life? Daniel 8, verses 11 and 12 say of this same power, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So the truth is cast down by this power over the centuries of the dark ages, and specifically, it's truth as it relates to the sanctuary. Now here's depiction of the sanctuary. And we're going to um, summarize the symbols contained in the sanctuary. They all pointed to Jesus. So the bread, or we'll start with the gate, that, that door separating the uh, courtyard from everything outside of the sanctuary. The gate represents Jesus. Jesus said in John 10, verse 9, I am the door. When you go through the gate, the first thing you see is the altar of burnt offering. And Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So every sacrifice ever altered on that altar of burnt offering ultimately represents Jesus and his sacrifice, the only sacrifice that can actually provide forgiveness for sins and atonement for sins and cleansing for sin. Right behind the altar of burnt offering was the laver or that little wash basin. This is where the priests would wash their hands and their feet before entering into the tabernacle or the tent portion of the sanctuary. Jesus said that he is the water of life. And I recall that conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well. He said, I will give you living water. You will never thirst again. And so Jesus is the water of life. Now, once you go inside the tabernacle, you have the table of showbread that sat on the north wall of the tabernacle in the holy place. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Again, all of these symbols are pointing to Jesus. Also in the holy place, you have the candlestick, which obviously gave light uh, to the inside of the tabernacle. Jesus said, I am the light of the world in John 8, verse 12. And then there was the altar of incense, which stood right in front of the curtain, separating the holy place from the most holy place. And it was here where the priests would go and they would... Um, uh, sometimes they would sprinkle blood here as well after they brought that in from the sacrifice. But it is primarily the place where the priest would stand and they would offer the incense, which would fill the entire tabernacle um, with the smell of this incense. And it represented their intercession for the uh, children of Israel. They were standing between God and the people as representatives both of the people and in a limited sense, as a representative of God. Now, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 7, verse 25, that Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. So the altar of incense is really also a picture or a representation of Jesus, our high priest. In Revelation chapter 8, let's turn there for just a moment. Uh, this is a beautiful explanation of, of what happens when we pray in faith. Revelation chapter 8 beginning in verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Friends, here's what the Bible is saying. When you pray, Jesus, gather those prayers in heaven. Your prayers ascend to Jesus in heaven, and as your high priest, he takes those prayers and he mixes them with the incense. He mixes them with his righteousness, with his great faith, and then he presents your prayers to the Father in heaven mixed with his prayers as well. Have you ever had those days where it felt like your prayers were hitting the ceiling and not going any higher? We all have, haven't we? And, and you're tempted to think, what's the point? Why go through this exercise? Nobody's hearing me. God isn't hearing me. What's the point? Friends, on those days especially, remember that you have a high priest in heaven 
who is waiting at heaven's door to hear your prayer and to grab that prayer, even if it has this much faith, and to mix it with his great faith and his righteousness, and then to present that prayer before the Father in heaven. It's a beautiful picture. This is what the altar of incense represents. And finally, we have the Ark of the Covenant. The only piece of furniture in the most holy place in the back part of the tabernacle. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, the law of God, written by the finger of God. Psalm 40, verse 8 says of the Messiah, Thy law is within my heart. And that's the same thing that God wants to accomplish in our lives. This is the new covenant promise, friends. We find it in Jeremiah. We find it in the book of Hebrews. It's given to God's people through all of time, whether they were part of that woman that was pregnant before the Messiah came or part of this woman, the body of Christ, after the time of of the Messiah. God wants to write his law on your minds and your hearts so that your thoughts and your words and your actions match with the thoughts and the words of actions of Jesus. So all of the sanctuary points to Jesus. And over the centuries, every single one of these points of truth that revealed who Jesus is and what he wants to do in our lives, every single one of these points was attacked. So people were taught that you cannot go straight to Jesus for salvation. You must work through the church. And so this is where you have uh, the sacraments, and, and which are really... Uh, ways in which the church supposedly transfers righteousness to you uh, and completely obliterates Jesus as the door to life. Um, The altar of burnt offering was lost sight of. And so rather than Jesus paying the price of sins completely and fully for you and you accepting that by faith, you ended up with uh, people doing what Martin Luther was doing, crawling up the steps in Rome, kissing each step, hoping to earn his way into salvation and earn his way into heaven. And many times it was much more graphic and extreme than simply crawling up some steps and kissing them. Uh, You know, some other forms of penance would be self-mutilation or self-flagellation, whipping yourself on the back, walking on hot coals, whatever it may be, whatever the priest determined was necessary for you to uh, work out the guilt of those sins in your life. Um, baptism, the symbolism of immersion in water, that was lost sight of, and other forms of baptism came in. Uh, The Bible itself, the bread of life, was locked away from the common people, both literally and in the language that was used. You know, for centuries, the only copies of the Bible, really, were in Latin. And uh, if you didn't speak Latin and you weren't a priest or something like that that had access to the few copies that existed, you did not have access to the word of God. Um, The altar of incense, you know, rather than praying directly to Jesus, people were taught that you need to go confess your sins to another human being. And um, all of these points of truth in the sanctuary, as they point to Jesus, were eventually completely forgotten and lost sight of. And here's what we read about the result of that. Great Controversy, page 60. The noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. The candlestick burned out. The Holy Scriptures were almost unknown, not only to the people, but to the priests. Like the Pharisees of old, the papal leaders hated the light which would reveal their sins. God's law, the standard of righteousness, having been removed, they exercised power without limit and practiced vice without restraint. Fraud, avarice, and profligacy prevailed. Men shrank from no crime by which they could gain wealth or position." The palaces of popes and prelates were scenes of the vilest debauchery. Some of the reigning pomptists were guilty of crimes so revolting that secular rulers endeavored to depose these dignitaries of the church as monsters too vile to be tolerated. For centuries, Europe had made no progress in learning, arts, or civilization. A moral and intellectual paralysis had fallen upon Christendom. And so over the centuries of the Dark Ages... Christianity becomes ill, then desperately ill, then terminally ill, and then nearly dies. And at this point in our study, we're going to dive back into the life of Jesus and look at the greatest miracle he ever performed. What we are told in the spirit of prophecy is the crowning uh, 
miracle of, of his life that proved his divinity beyond a shadow of a doubt, and that's the raising of Lazarus. And we're going to see how the raising of Lazarus uh, contains parallels with the Protestant Reformation. Now, the raising of Lazarus is recorded in John chapter 11. To save time, I will simply put on a list up here the key points of the story. Lazarus falls ill and dies in verse 17 um, through 44. Jesus raises Lazarus by his word. Jesus healed people in many different ways. Sometimes he asked them to do strange things like, you know, go wash in a pool or he rubbed mud on their eyes. This time Jesus simply stands there. Maybe he stretches his arm out, but he simply speaks and he says, Lazarus, come out, come forth. And so Jesus raises Lazarus by his word. Then in verse 45, many people believe on Jesus because of Lazarus. You can understand that. If we had advertised this weekend that um, you could come and hear the gospel preached, but you can also see someone that has been resurrected from the dead. We have a lot more people here tonight, wouldn't we? And so uh, people wanted to hear what Lazarus had to say. And as he witnessed about Jesus, many put their faith in Jesus. Then in verse 46, we read how the Jews held a council to kill Jesus and Lazarus. They wanted them both dead. And finally, in verse 54, Jesus retreats to the wilderness to avoid this controversy for a little bit longer. Now, Desire of Ages, page 529, says, This crowning miracle, the raising of Lazarus, was to set the seal of God on his work and on his claim to divinity. And I would suggest to us tonight, and you will see some of these parallels uh, as we finish our study, that God's work in the Protestant Reformation of bringing spiritual life back into his body, the church, leads to the seal of God. We'll see that tomorrow night. And is the claim to his divinity and his authority here on earth now, and especially that divinity and authority as it is um, uh, realized through the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing the word of God to life in our hearts. So when we look at uh, the life of Christ here, again, here's some of the things that happened in the time of Lazarus. Let's just look at the parallels with church history. Lazarus falls ill and dies. Well, the church fell Ill, Ill spiritually during the Dark Ages. Jesus raises Lazarus by his word, and God revives the church through his word in the Reformation. The Reformers had several watchwords or word, uh, phrases that they would keep coming back to to explain their position and their, the source of their faith. And one of those was uh, by the word of God alone. With also uh, sole fide, by faith alone, and uh, it, was, it was really faith in the Word of God that uh, drove and fueled the Reformation. Also, many believed on Jesus because of Lazarus' testimony. Uh, and as the truth of the Bible, and especially of Jesus as our high priest in heaven, as all these sanctuary truths began to be recovered and remembered, people began placing their trust in Jesus as our high priest. Um, uh, just uh, similarly to how happened in the Reformation. The Jews held a council to kill Jesus and Lazarus. We have in history something called the Council of Trent and the Counter-Reformation that sprang from it. This was the effort to squash and stop and destroy the Protestant Reformation. Now, I'm sure they hoped to do it quickly, and it took 500 years. But in 2017... Uh, many, many Christians, many, many former Protestants said, we're tired of being Protestants and uh, we're not protesting anything anymore. The Reformation is done and we want to reunite and come back together. Jesus then retreated to the wilderness and uh, the woman is described as fleeing to the wilderness again. And finally, Jesus was condemned at his trial for his testimony. Luke chapter 22 tells us that. And Revelation 12, verse 17 says that the remnant of the woman's seed is persecuted for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to focus uh, in our last session together on this testimony of Jesus Christ, what this means for us today. I hope that you can be there for that study. Psalm 107, verse 20 says, He, that is God, sent his word and he healed them and he delivered them from their destructions. What was true in the life of Jesus, the head, when he rose Lazarus from the dead, 
was also true spiritually in the life of the body. When God sent his word, he unlocked the Bible, right? People could begin reading it in their own languages. Copies were reproduced. The printing press was developed right at this time. And people began reading and studying the word of God for themselves. It brought spiritual life back into the church and fueled this healing process of the Protestant Reformation. So what was recovered in the Protestant Reformation? Well, let's look at those points in the sanctuary again. The table of showbread representing the Word of God. John Wycliffe and others, but he was one of the first, translated the Bible into English. And um, Spirit of Prophecy calls John Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation. And it was through his work and others, William Tyndale would be another example, as they translated the Word of God and unlocked it for the people, truth came back and spiritual healing began to take place. What about the altar of burnt offering? Again, that points to Jesus and his sacrifice for sins. Martin Luther taught and wrote about many things, but the theme he kept coming back to was righteousness by faith. You do not have to perform these works of penance. You don't need indulgences and all of this uh, to supposedly work your way into God's favor or help pay off the penalty of your sins. Accept Jesus in his sacrifice for you. That's the lesson of the altar burnt offering. Contemporary to Martin Luther was John Calvin, and one of his big themes was prayer. You can pray directly to Jesus, and so the truth of the altar of incense is brought back. Uh, a little bit later, in the early 1600s, you had John Smith and the others uh, and the early Baptist movement. They recover uh, the symbolism and the meaning of baptism by immersion and begin baptizing people uh, as we read in the Bible, with complete immersion in the water. So the symbolism of the laver in the water is brought back. And then John Wesley, a century after that, and the others working with him, really began the modern missionary movement, taking the gospel to the world. He famously said once, uh, or wrote, uh, the world is my parish. And, and so the light of truth, and the um, witnessing that is done through the power of the Holy Spirit, this is all symbolized by the candlestick. And so this truth is brought back as well. We read in Great Controversy, page four, uh, 249, the grand principle maintained by these reformers was the infallible authority of the Holy Scriptures as a rule of faith and practice. They denied the right of popes, councils, fathers, and kings to control the conscience in matters of religion. The Bible was their authority, and by its teaching they tested all doctrines and all claims. Now they disagreed on certain points here and there. And, uh, you know, not, most of them never accepted the Sabbath truth as well. But the one thing they did recognize, the one foundation they did share, was their belief and acceptance in the Bible as the Word of God, as the Word of God and as the ultimate and final authority in their lives personally and, and in the authority and the life of the church. And we're going to compare the experience of these reformers with the experience of somebody else that was uh, living at their time, and he ended up spearheading the Counter-Reformation, this Council of Trent that um, uh, was designed uh, or developed, brought into being, in order to stop the Protestant Reformation. And we're going to do this for a simple reason. We want to compare and contrast two approaches to spirituality and religion. And it's not just a historical exercise, friends. We're going to see that these two approaches to determining truth are very much alive in our world today. And in fact, will determine whether people are saved and lost through Earth's final events. So this uh, individual's name was uh, Loyola, and we read from James Wiley's book, The History of the Protestant Reformation. To foster the growth of the Jesuit army, Loyola had prepared beforehand his book entitled Spiritual Exercises. This is a body of rules for teaching men how to conduct the work of their conversion. I'll just stop right there. These are spiritual exercises that you do, according to Loyola, to affect the work of your own conversion. 
It consists of four grand meditations, and the penitent retiring into solitude is to occupy absorbingly his mind on each succession during the space of the rising and setting of seven suns. So there is something conspicuously, uh, conspicuously lacking in these spiritual exercises, and that is the Word of God. The Bible has no part in these spiritual exercises, and instead of coming to a divinely inspired uh, message to humanity to base this experience on, in Loyola's method or spiritual exercises of spiritual formation, it's all based on your own experience, on what happens in your mind, in your imagination, and your senses. Now, we'll see this explained as we go on. The person was, first of all, to go aside from the world by entirely isolating himself from all the affairs of life. Now, I I have to stop. Did Jesus ever tell his disciples to isolate themselves from the rest of the world? Of course not. He said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the world. He sent them out to interact with the world, to share with people, to help people as he had done. So here we have another major departure from biblical truth and from the model that Jesus has given. In the solemn stillness of his chamber, he was to engage in four meditations each day, the first at daybreak, the last at midnight. To assist the action of the imagination on the soul, the room was to be artificially darkened, and on its walls were to be suspended pictures of hell and other horrors. Sin, death, and judgment were exclusively to occupy the thoughts of the penitent during the first week of his seclusion. So, disconnected from the Word of God, disconnected from the world, entering a dark room where pictures are displayed in front of you. It almost sounds like going into a movie theater, doesn't it? And now allowing your imagination to just run as it will on whatever it sees in front of it. The second week, he was to withdraw his eye from these dreadful spectacles and fix it upon the Incarnation. The third week is to witness the solemn act of the soul's enrollment in the army of that great captain, Two cities are before the devotee, Jerusalem and Babylon, in which will he choose to dwell. Now comes his fourth and last week, and with it there comes a great change in the subjects of his meditation. He is to surround himself with light and flowers and odors. He is to rest, and in that rest to taste the prelude of everlasting joys. This mood of mind he is to cultivate while seven suns rise and set upon him. He is now perfected and fit to fight in the army of the great captain. Friends, here's the point. There are two ways, two methods presented to the world today of how to attain sanctification, of how to attain perfection, of how to attain uh, fulfillment in life. One is what we just read. Whatever feels right, right? Whatever seems right to you, whatever you experience, whatever your imagination or mind tells you seems like is reality, go for it. And the other way is the Word of God. I find it in the Bible. I accept it as truth. I believe it. And by God's help and by His strength, I will order my life according to the things in this Word. Friends, there are only two options for us today. And the Bible tells us very clearly in Revelation chapter 13 that most of the world at the end of time, will not choose the Bible as its source of authority and determining what is reality. Revelation 13, verse 13 says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image unto the beast which had the wound by a sword." And did live. Friends, here's the point. At the end of time, people will be making their decisions for eternity. They will be deciding what is true and false, not based on the Bible, but based on what their senses are telling them is reality. If I see it, if I hear it, if I feel it, if I taste it, if I touch it, it must be true. It must be real. And friends, the devil is setting up humanity for a grand deception with lots of littler deceptions along the way so that they will accept something other than the Word of God and somebody other than Jesus Christ at the end of the day. Great Controversy, page 625, 
asks this question. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. To all the testing time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. And then this question, are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden, that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. What occupies your time? What occupies your attention and your energy? What kinds of things receive the best portion of your energy and your enthusiasm in life? These are important questions that we need to ask, aren't they? You know, the devil is a master at throwing at us anything and everything that will distract us and, and, and keep us uh, away from that relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, there are two things, Revelation 14, verse 12, two things on which we must stand if we will be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Here they are, Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And friends, these are the two exact things that the beast power today calls fundamentalism and says we need to beware uh, on guard against this. Uh, and anybody that has this attitude toward the Bible, that uh, the Bible is the ultimate authority, or I, I, I can come directly to Jesus. According to the beast power, friends, this is fundamentalism, and it's dangerous, and it needs to be eliminated. So, friends, we can see this coming conflict, and it's a conflict that has been a long time in the building. It goes all the way back, well, really to the beginning, but we see it uh, exemplified here through the Middle Ages, as Christianity compromised with the world around it, eventually became ill and, like Lazarus, died. If you remember the story of Lazarus, Jesus' disciples urged him to go sooner because they knew that if Jesus showed up, Lazarus would be healed. You know, sickness, just like sin, cannot live and survive in the presence of the Creator. And the disciples could not understand why Jesus waited and did not immediately go to Lazarus. And we know, we've seen the statements tonight, that Jesus waited so that he could perform the crowning miracle of his life and, and give that greatest evidence possible that he is the Messiah. He allowed something similar to happen to the church through the Middle Ages. He allowed it to get sick. He allowed it to die spiritually, almost, so that he could work a great miracle by sending them his word and healing his people, bringing them back uh, to relationship directly with Jesus Christ, accepting him as their savior, placing their faith in the word of God so that they could walk with him. Now, we have laid the groundwork. Last night and tonight, we have been looking at things in the past. Uh, Tomorrow, and, and in the fourth study, we are now going to be looking at um, what is happening today. Where are we? We're going to focus on this remnant church of Revelation 12, verse 17. And we're going to see what does it mean today to walk with Jesus? We've seen what it meant in the past, right? Whatever happens to the head must happen to the body. So in the Old Testament, if you wanted to know were you part of the body of Christ, you look at that visible, organized body on earth that would match the Messiah's life. That was Old Testament Israel. The same thing happened in um, the transition now to the church as the body of Christ in New Testament times. We've looked at those examples. We've looked at those parallels. And all of that now has laid the foundation for us so that we can ask a simple question. What does it mean today to walk with Jesus, to follow wherever he goes? What does it mean personally for me in my life? What does it mean for my family? 
What does it mean for an entire church or an organized visible body of Christ today to walk with Jesus? And I'll, I'll just give you one clue, friends. If you are looking for the true church, that remnant church of Revelation, you need to find a church that not only teaches what's in the Bible, not only, not only has faith in Jesus, not only teaches the law of God, but you must also find a church whose history and prophetic future parallels the life of Jesus Christ. Because whatever happens to the head must also happen to the body. And church, that, uh, friends, that church is there. And God has his body on earth today. And he wants each one of us to be part of that. And he wants us to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've heard this poem before. I was dreaming one night, and in my dream I was walking with Jesus on the seashore. And as we walked, we talked about the different experiences of my life. And uh, at one point, as we were talking about some of the most bitter, difficult experiences in my life, I looked back, and I noticed that there was only one set of footprints in the sand. And I stopped, and I turned to Jesus, and I asked him, why was it? in the most difficult part of my life, that you left me to walk alone. And he turned to me and he said, my child, it was at that time in your life that I picked you up and I carried you in my arms. Friends, Jesus wants to pick you up. He wants to carry you in his arms and he wants to walk with you into the pearly gates. And he's promised that he can bring you there if you continue walking with him. How many of you want to do that? How many of you want to make that commitment? I will walk with Jesus. I will follow him no matter where he leads. Amen. God bless. We'll see you again tomorrow night.